Katmai region of southern Alaska. Here in the shadow of sleeping volcanoes, springtime is always the same. Sometime in early March, winter's grip begins to loosen. Over the next few months, a frozen wasteland gradually returns to life. As the water warms, salmon eggs begin to stir. Alaska's bears awaken from their wintry nap. As summer approaches, the cycle of life will continue as it always has. After two years in inland lakes, the salmon fry will turn into smolt and begin their singular odyssey toward the sea, providing a meal for someone all along the way. In the shadow of sleeping volcanoes, springtime is always the same. The tundra swans will arrive from the south and build their nests and spend the summer in the shadow of sleeping volcanoes, where springtime was always the same. Until the springtime of 1912. The sleeping volcano lay about 20 miles inland at the head of a broad, fertile valley. Ever since the previous winter, the native Aleutians living on the Alaska Peninsula had noticed something strange. Mount Katmai was spooking the animals. No moose, no caribou were seen near the sleeping volcano. They seemed wary. Did these animals perhaps know more than we? Did they feel something that told them of the future? On June 1st, the earth began to tremble intermittently. A strange feeling bound us as if we might be waiting for disaster, though we scarcely knew what we feared. Work ceased altogether about noon as the noise and the quakes increased. Seventy miles away, on Kodiak Island, 500 inhabitants were preparing for the spring salmon season. At one o'clock, on June 6th, 
it happened. Slowly, in every direction, the sky began to darken. A few dozen miles offshore, seamen on the mail ship Dora watched in astonishment as the day swiftly turned into night. At 6.30 p.m., ashes commenced to fall and in a few minutes we were in complete darkness. Not even the water over the ship's side could be seen. Lurid flashes of lightning glared continuously round the ship, while a constant boom of thunder, sometimes coinciding with the flash, increased the horror of the inferno raging about us. Many thought then spoke of the destruction of Pompeii the feeble glow of the electric lights and lanterns, failing to dispel the awful darkness. A few miles away, on Kodiak Island, hundreds of panicked villagers rushed onto the largest ship in the harbor, hoping to sail out of harm's way. But the darkness was so impenetrable, they were forced to turn back. The crowded ship was stranded at anchor, unable to move. Days passed, and still the deluge of ash showed no sign of stopping. My dear wife, Tanya, a mountain has burst near here so that we are covered with ashes in some places 10 feet and 6 feet deep. Night and day we light lamps. We cannot see the daylight. Here are darkness and hell, thunder and noise, and we are expecting death at any moment. God is merciful. Pray for us. Your husband, Ivan Orloff. On June 9th, after three days of total darkness, the sun finally reappeared. As the residents of Kodiak returned to their homes, they found their island utterly transformed. Everything lay buried under a layer of ash, sometimes to a depth of five or six feet. All signs of life seemed to have been extinguished in a landscape that had become as barren as the moon. Gradually, it began to dawn on them that they had survived something truly extraordinary, one of the largest volcanic eruptions in the history of man. Years later, scientists would calculate the force and the effect of the explosion, which was centered in the Katmai Valley. The cloud of ash that enveloped Kodiak was so large, it eventually covered most of the northern hemisphere. If a similar explosion were to occur in New York City, it would bury Philadelphia in a foot of ash and plunge the city into complete darkness for 60 hours. Residents of Chicago would clearly hear the explosion. In Denver, volcanic dust would tarnish brass and acid rain would fray clothing. New York City, the site of the eruption, would simply vanish. In the aftermath of the Katmai eruption, 
One question was foremost in the minds of those who had survived it. How would the rain of ash affect life in the area? Would the formerly abundant vegetation ever return? And with it, the birds and the salmon and the bears? Those questions still hadn't been answered three years later when an expedition sponsored by the National Geographic Society arrived in Kodiak. It was led by a young botanist named Robert Griggs. Griggs wanted to find out how various life forms were adapting to the dramatic changes in the water and soil. But instead of the desolate wasteland he expected, Griggs found an island bursting with life. Everyone agrees that the eruption was the best thing that ever happened to Kodiak. In the words of our hotel keeper, never was any such grass known before, so high or so early. No one ever believed the country could grow so many berries, nor so large, before the ash. Griggs analyzed the ash, but found it had no nutritive value at all. Instead, it seemed to act as a kind of mulch, aerating the soil and smothering weeds, which allowed the fruit-bearing plants to thrive. But the town of Kodiak lay 100 miles southeast of the Katmai Valley, where the eruption was centered. No one had investigated the mainland where the ash was heaviest. Griggs took a boat across the Shelikov Strait to see for himself what had happened. There, along the coastline, he found a dead zone. The grasses were gone. Most of the trees were dead or dying. There were a few small fish in the rivers, but no salmon. He saw a few bare tracks, but never the animal itself. And that was just along the coast. No one knew what conditions were like further inland, beyond the mountains that guarded the valley where the eruption had occurred. Ground Zero was still a mystery, one that Griggs decided he must solve. Late in the summer of 1915, Griggs tried to make his way inland to see if he could reach Mount Katmai. But the ash-covered terrain was so impassable, he was forced to turn back. He returned to Kodiak sure of only one thing, that the Katmai eruption must have been one of the largest in human history. Volcanic eruptions can take several spectacular forms. Lava flows where super-hot magma pours directly out of the Earth are the Earth's way of releasing pent-up energies gradually. But the Earth sometimes releases that energy all at once. These explosions are much less beautiful and far more deadly. May 18th, 1980. The side of Mount St. Helens in Washington gives way, sending a blast of scalding gas and debris across the countryside at 200 miles an hour, leveling everything in its path. 61 people are killed. June 15th, 1991, Mount Pinatubo erupts in a massive explosion. 
Over the next few weeks, two billion tons of pumice and ash rained down on the Philippines, killing nearly 900 people. The Katmai eruption was four times the size of Pinatubo and 100 times more powerful than Mount St. Helens. And still, four years after the fact, no one had been able to cross the foreboding terrain to the source of the eruption. Robert Griggs was determined to be the first. In the spring of 1916, he organized a second expedition. Once again, they moved through a lunar-like landscape as they made their way inland, over trails that were no longer there, crossing rivers that weren't on any map. On July 19th, they came to the base of Mount Katmai and began the long, dangerous climb to the summit. At 5,500 feet, they reached the rim of the crater and took their first look over the side. The whole crater lay below us. It was of immense size and seemed of an infinite depth. About half of the bottom was occupied by a wonderful blue and green vitriolic lake with the crescent-shaped remains of an ash cone near the middle. This, then, was ground zero at least in Griggs' mind. Noting that the mountain was merely a stub of what it had been in former days, Griggs estimated that it had stood 2,000 feet higher before it exploded in the spring of 1912. His mission apparently accomplished, Griggs was preparing to return to Kodiak when he became intrigued by a wisp of smoke in the distance. Another day's trudge seemed to have brought the expedition no closer to the source of the smoke. And Griggs was ready to turn back when he decided to climb one more hill. When he reached the top, he was dumbfounded by the strange panorama that lay before him. I can never forget my sensations at the sight which met my eyes as I surmounted the hillock and looked down the valley. For there, stretching as far as the eye could reach, were hundreds, no, thousands of little volcanoes. They were not so little either. Many of them were sending up columns of steam which rose a thousand feet before dissolving. It was as though all the steam engines in the world assembled together had popped their safety valves at once and were letting off surplus steam in concert. In the next few years, Griggs would return to the valley again and again, bringing with him an assortment of observers, botanists and chemists, geologists and photographers, none of them had ever seen anything quite like the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. On first entering the valley, I experienced the same sensation as the man who on seeing a giraffe for the first time exclaimed, there ain't no such animal. Myriads of columns of vapor from the floor of a wide, desolate valley all vividly recalled Sinbad's adventures in the Arabian Nights. It is so unreal. Several times when we accidentally put a foot through a thin place in the crust, steam came spouting out of the hole, forming a new fumarole. But it was always one foot only, and the owner did not take long to get out. Everything seemed on such a huge scale. Our tents looked insignificant, pitched among the gaping fissures and the roaring volcanic vents. 
I was more and more impressed by the titanic forces that had been at work here. I felt out of place and like an intruder in this land of the gods. But the land of the gods had its hellish side as well. The steaming fumaroles emitted a constant sulfuric stench, and the temperatures inside them were too hot to measure. Acid in the moisture ate away at tents and clothing, and there was always the fear that one false step might lead to being boiled alive. But at least one human activity was easier in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. While experimenting to find the best place to hold the pan, we tried pushing it down into the cavern below the orifice. But no sooner had the fry pan passed below the surface than, piff, the bacon was whisked out of the pan and went flying in every direction through the air to be eagerly caught and devoured by the waiting spectators who howled with delight at this sudden turn of events, which, after being discovered accidentally, was repeated again and again until we tired of chasing the flying slices. During his many trips to Katmai, Griggs became convinced that the valley was developing into a vast, permanent geyser field. In 1918, he persuaded President Woodrow Wilson to declare the valley a national monument. In his view, it would someday rival Yellowstone as a tourist attraction. But as it turned out, Griggs was wrong, as he was wrong in many of his assumptions about the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Today, only a handful of tourists visit the valley floor during the long days of summer. The air is clear. The clouds of steam have dissipated. The 10,000 smokes are gone. All that remains is a blanket of ash that covers nearly 40 square miles. Eighty years of snow and rain have shaped and softened the contours of the ash, carving out a labyrinth of canyons, gullies, gorges, and ravines. The terrain is so alien that American astronauts came here to train for the first landings on the moon. Photographer Mark Emery is one of the few people who regularly braves Katmai's inhospitable landscape. The consistency of this stuff is, is very similar to sand. And when Griggs first came to the valley, that's kind of what he thought this was, with a lot of hot sand. Or you can see kind of behind us here, this wall of volcanic ash. And in this particular area, it's several hundred feet thick. Uh, it looks like it's something you couldn't walk on, but actually you can. It's, it's uh, kind of like walking on a construction site. And the upper end of the valley can even be deeper, 300, 400, maybe even 500 feet deep. One of Griggs' mistakes was believing that the steam he saw was being produced by a huge pool of magma just beneath the valley floor. Now, all across the valley here are steam vents, and when Griggs first came here, he thought that it was smoke. So he named it the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Now most of them are collapsed back down and cooled, but what was happening was this hot ash completely covered the valley floor. There were creeks and glacial streams here, and when it did, it sealed all that water in, and that came back up as steam. It was superheated and shot back up through these vents. But the heat trapped within the layers of ash was temporary. 
When the ash cooled, the spectacle that greeted the first explorers disappeared. But something far more important than smoke and steam has begun to reappear in the valley. Today, scattered here and there, are signs of life. Actually, a lot of the vegetation in the valley is, I think, making kind of a little bit of a comeback. Initially, everything was just slathered over in hot ash. Now, over a period of time, there's a little bit of topsoil, and these flowers are just starting to make a comeback in the valley floor. They seem to be even more remarkable because of where they are. But even as the valley continues to shake off its mantle of ash, conditions here are ripe for yet another eruption sometime in the future. Thousands of feet beneath the surface, a geological time bomb is waiting to go off. About six miles away from Mount Katmai stands a strange, dark structure made mostly of volcanic glass. One of Griggs' team named it Novarupta. Griggs himself believed it was the site of a large secondary eruption. But once again, Griggs was mistaken. It took scientists another 30 years to understand what really happened on that long ago springtime afternoon. Volcanologist John Eichelberger has been studying Novarupta for more than six years. It's easy to understand why Griggs thought that Mount Katmai was the main source of the eruption. After all, most of the huge mountain had disappeared. But he didn't have the benefit of uh, over 80 years of science and technology that's gone on since that time. We understand a lot more about volcanism now and have many more techniques for studying volcanoes than he had back then. In 1953, scientists discovered something curious. The layer of ash around Novarupta was much deeper than it was around Mount Katmai. And it turned out the two were connected by a huge underground chamber filled with magma. Could it have been from Novarupta and not Mount Katmai that a column of ash nearly 20 miles high burst forth? Subsequent testing proved that it was. The amount of material that came out is really phenomenal. In 60 hours, about six cubic miles of six boxes a mile on a side came out of this hole in the ground. It's just a tremendous amount of material. This ash-laden cloud is just like an enormous jet engine coming out of the center of this thing. It eroded this big hole that got bigger and bigger. Then finally, at the close of the activity, lava came oozing up in the center of the crater and made that nice uh, little dome in the center of the crater. The fact that Griggs and many others mistook Mount Katmai for the source of the eruption is understandable. Mount Katmai was the source of the eruption, but in a very roundabout way. Volcanic eruptions begin with movement deep within the Earth's mantle, where gigantic plates shift and collide almost imperceptibly with each other. The Katmai region sits atop just such a place. In a continual process known as subduction, the collision forces one plate downward, creating enough heat to melt rock and enough stress to cause earthquakes. Eventually, the molten rock collects as magma and floats upward, forming volcanoes. Beneath them sit chambers of magma that either release their pressure slowly or violently. On June 6, 1912, the magma found a weakness in the valley floor and erupted. 
draining the chamber under Mount Katmai. The resulting void caused it to collapse, giving Mount Katmai the appearance of an exploded volcano. But Nova Rupta didn't collapse, and that makes it special. There are really three reasons why this is a very important volcano. One is it's, it's very young, it's still hot. Another thing is it's enormous. It's the biggest eruption of the century. But for our purposes, the most important thing is that it's relatively simple. This is a one-shot deal. There was not a volcano here before 1912. This magma came up through very simple geology and blew in one single, relatively simple event. Nova Rupta is a rare kind of formation, a perfectly preserved volcanic vent. It is also the youngest rhyolite dome in the world. Rhyolite magma probably contains the most water of any magma, and as a result, it's most explosive. It creates incredible explosions, like the one that uh, showered Kodiak 100 miles away with a foot of ash. But it also, as we see here, comes out peacefully, just as lava. And this, is, to me, is one of the most fascinating problems in volcanology is just how volcanoes behave, that the same magma sometimes can flow out rather peacefully and at other times can erupt with more power than the biggest atomic bomb ever built. Today, much of the six cubic miles of ash emitted by Nova Rupta still covers the valley and no one knows how long it will take for it to dissipate. But little by little, the ash is being washed away, carried out of the valley by the streams and rivers that snake their way toward the many lakes in the area, or the sea still further away. But if the valley itself is still largely a wasteland, the area surrounding it has made a dramatic recovery since the days when Griggs first ventured here. For a nature photographer like Mark Emery, the capacity of the land to heal itself is nothing short of amazing. You have to remember that right after the eruption, this place looked like the moon. Ash covered everything and nothing would grow. So there was no food for the animals and they left. Once the vegetation started coming back, the animals came back too. One animal in particular has regained its former dominance. Today, the Katmai National Park boasts the highest density of brown bears anywhere on Earth. The bears in this area are some of the largest in the world. Around here we call them brown bears, but biologically they're actually grizzly bears. Their food source here is so much richer that they grow larger than bears in, in say, Yellowstone Park, for instance. Bears are omnivorous eaters and will consume almost anything, including Katmai's abundant grasses. On good years, there's so much food around that the bears have plenty of time to play. These two bears that we see a good bit, I guess they're siblings, it's not uncommon to see them play fighting for hours and ducking and dodging like boxers. I suppose it's important practice for when they're adults and have to defend their territories. For now, it just kind of looks like they're having fun. The survival of the brown bears has been helped by the continued regeneration of another species. It is midsummer in Alaska, and the sockeye salmon are back. 
Most of these salmon are about five years old, returning to the waters upriver where they were born. Even in the best of times, their journey is a difficult one. In the years after the eruption, the rivers were choked with ash and floating stone. But somehow the salmon survived. And that, in turn, helped the bears. From the early summer on, salmon will provide most of the food the bears will need to survive the winter. And with so much food around, there's nothing much for a bear to do except eat and play. But eating isn't as easy for some bears as it is for others. As the salmon near the end of their five-year odyssey, a startling transformation occurs. First, their color changes from silvery green to an iridescent red. By this stage in their migration, they have stopped feeding and their metamorphosis accelerates. Soon, a hump appears on their backs. Their jaws lengthen and begin to curve upward. They even digest their own skin for nourishment and literally begin to disintegrate. In hundreds of inland lakes, the salmon mass for their final act, the most vital they will ever perform. The females fan the gravel bed to make their nests, 
Then, eggs and sperm are released simultaneously. Of the 3,000 or so eggs dispensed by each female, only four or five will reach maturity, and fewer still will return to spawn. Yet somehow, by sheer force of numbers, another cycle of salmon is renewed, and the generation that renewed it begins to die. In the shadow of sleeping volcanoes, autumn is always the same. It is September in Katmai. In less than a month, the first snows will arrive. The last salmon have made their way upriver to spawn and provide a final snack for the bears. Gradually, the daylight thins. The bears are fat and glossy this time of year, masters of all they survey. Everything prepares for winter. Perhaps the animals know that the earth beneath their feet has started to shudder again. We know that seismic activity in the valley has increased in recent years. Even though this park was initially set up to study volcanoes, it ended up creating a haven for bears and fish and other wildlife. On the other hand, if it goes off again, it could just as easily destroy it all. We often think of volcanoes as uh, something that uh, happened in the past when the dinosaurs were around or something. But really, there's as much volcanic activity now as, as there was when the dinosaurs were around. The planet is a very dynamic place. There will be more eruptions perhaps next week or next year or next decade. The scene here isn't finished. We've just arrived after one big event and perhaps just before the next big one. Someday in the future, the Katmai Valley will erupt again. But for now, the valley is quiet. Season follows season as it almost always has. And somewhere beneath all this, the plates of the earth are moving against each other, waiting for the day that the ground starts to shake and a cloud darkens the skies once again. <laughs> 